Hey, well, welcome everyone. This is the, um, the Dean's Speaker Series. We do one of these every quarter. And it's a real privilege for me today to welcome um, a friend of mine and a former student of mine, uh, Charlene uh, Turner. Uh, yes, Turner. We keep yeah. thinking Warner Turner. I know. But, yeah. <laughs> but uh, very nice to have you here, Charlene. But just to tell you a little bit about the Dean's Speaker Series. Uh, this is a, an event we hold every quarter. We bring folks in from various industries who are um, leaders in their field. And just to tell you a little bit about their experience with leadership and how they have emerged with leadership over the years and then how their industry has changed and um, what kinds of things they've noticed uh, in terms of how you might best prepare as students today for, for future roles that you might see that you have as you emerge as a business professional. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. And so we're very grateful for Charlene to come here. And it's a real privilege for me to introduce her. She was a student here and graduated in 1990. Was it that? And that really dates me. So <laughs> I feel terrible when I say that. But, uh, uh, and, and so, uh, but Charlotte graduated here and uh, she's married to Bill and they have a daughter together. And Bill uh, also was a graduate mm -hmm. of our, uh, in 91. Yeah. Okay, but they didn't meet here. They met in their small town in eastern Washington in the Okanagan Valley. And so that's been an interesting journey for both of them. And Bill's an economist, and he occasionally does adjunct teaching for us. So um, they're really uh, have been uh, tremendous and good friends of SPU over the years. Um, Charlene has works for Peterson and Sullivan, and they are a large CPA firm downtown. They have nearly 200 employees now. And uh, when she started with the firm, they only had 40 employees. So you can see it's really interesting how her um, Peterson and Sullivan as a, as a firm has grown. And they're a CPA firm, which is a kind of a full service CPA firm. They do um, audits and tax work and consulting work. Charlene's in the audit business uh, on the audit side. And, uh, and the interesting thing about their firm is that they do all the full gambit of audits. They do not-for-profit auditing, they do um, company, regular for-profit company audits, and they also do what we call SEC work, which means that these are clients that are public companies. And so Charlene, one of her specialties is knowing all about what we call the PCAOB, which is the Public Accounting uh, Stand uh, Oversight Board, which kind of looks at how auditing is done with public SEC type companies. And so she has to be pretty well up on what they are looking for as uh, when you when a company offers stock to the public, it kind of ups the ante. And so they do some uh, audits in that area. And then um, Charlene has some specialty. She um, is kind of specialized around real estate, financial institutions, and, uh, and uh, life sciences. And so very interested in all those kinds of areas. And so auditing and accounting is a bit like that these days, isn't it? You have to kind of specialize around some industries. And so it's just, um, delight. I'm just delighted to have her here today. And she does a lot of community service. Uh, she's been involved in the Seattle Waldorf schools and boards of trustees there. And, uh, and she's just kind of out and about in the community. And uh, when you're a partner in a large CPA firm, you've got to be a, um, well connected and kind of bringing in new clients and that kind of thing. And you can see that their firm's done such a great job of that over the last few years. And so you've got to have kind of an all-round skill set, and so I'm excited to learn a little bit about that today. So anyway, without further ado, Charmin, welcome to S back to SBU. Really appreciate you coming to talk to us today. And by the way, we've got students here from Business Finance, um, 3250, is that right? Yeah. Uh, kind of an introductory finance class for business students. And then we've got accounting students from Intermediate Accounting 1, yep. which is the best class in the world, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we've got some accountants for you and okay. some finance students. Welcome. Okay. Let's give her a round. Thanks for having me. And um, so I'm, I'm going to share a little bit about what my career story has been like. And I tend to be a person who goes off on tangents, so I have my notes, which you'll appreciate, keep me on track. But, so with all of you as the majority of you business students, right, 
in thinking about your major and thinking about what you want to do, I'm assuming you put a lot of thought and time and consideration into that for the most part. So if you were talking to a friend of yours who has an older brother, say, would you, could you ever imagine telling that friend who's considering what to major in that, you know, don't worry about it. Just do whatever your older brother told you to do. Would you ever say that to anybody? And so that's kind of what I did. I pretty much majored in accounting at SPU because that's what my older brother told me to do. Uh, sorry, Ross. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> As, um, so I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So I have an older brother who is obviously highly influential. So he was the perfect kid. It's difficult being his little sister. And he was valedictorian, and he chose WSU to go to college. And he was in the honors program, of course. And, and so it was kind of a foregone conclusion in my family that that's where I would also go. And so that's exactly where I didn't want to go. He picked the big school in the little town. And so I chose, I wanted to come to the big city. So uh, I grew up in a small little town in Eastern Washington. And, and I loved SPU being, because actually I was kind of afraid of the big city. So it felt like a little safe bubble being here. And, and so I, it took a lot of work to get my dad on board because he thought I should go to WSU. But one visit to campus and, and he was sold. So I got to come here. And I initially came here thinking that I was going to be an English major. My mother was a librarian, so the whole time growing up, I was a bookworm, spent a lot of time in the library, and loved to read. So that'd be a great major, right? And I started you know, doing more research about what job opportunities went along with an English major, and none of that was really appealing. And, and so that's what kind of moved me more towards the business school. And initially I was thinking marketing and that you know, I could be creative, could still use some of my writing skills, but in a business environment. So as soon as my brother found out that I was thinking business, he chose accounting at WSU. So then he started really applying the pressure. Well, if you're going to do business, then you should of course do accounting because whatever he chooses is the best thing, right? And that's kind of how I was brainwashed as well. And um, so I took a couple accounting classes and you know, you kind of have to in the business school anyway. And, and they, they were okay. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right. And talked to a couple of professors and, and it was really stressed to me that, all right, you go to college to get a job, right? You want to position yourself for getting a job. So in accounting, you could usually find some kind of a job after graduation. And, and then with it being the foundation of business, that you could always work into marketing or something else related, but, and still have the accounting degree. And you can do accounting anywhere. So if you move out of state, that would be okay, and you can still find a job. So I kind of unenthusiastically declared my major as accounting, and all right, I'll get a job. So that's how, but then of course it doesn't stop there. So once you have the accounting degree, then you have to take the CPA exam, so studying for that, then I found out, oh, well, that only gets you certified. You still can't use those initials until you're actually licensed. And you have to have the work experience to get licensed. And certainly in, it, in 1990, there were very limited ways you could get licensed other than working for a CPA firm. You pretty much had to go to work for a CPA firm to get the experience requirements in. And now it's a little bit easier to do that outside of public accounting and the experience will still count. But then that was pretty much the only viable option. So that's what I did. And, and it, it was just so I could get my license, I could get, put those initials at the end of my name, and, and then that would position me for a good job, right? And so I got an internship my senior year in tax, so that's what my experience was in. So my first job at a CPA firm was in the tax department. And eventually I ended up moving into audit, which now when I look back, I think I, doing tax, it sounds like it's not fun, but it is actually kind of fun when you do it. And, and now when I think back to what I liked about tax, I think it's the auditor in me, because I'm a naturally nosy person. And so it's kind of fun preparing people's tax returns and see how much money they make and where they invest it. And you can make all kinds of judgments about them, about how much money they give away, who they give it to, 
And, you know, and, then if, and then you see how much money they make and when you make the phone call on how much they owe and they whine and complain about it, it's like, really? Are you kidding me? And so that's kind of the fun part. But once you get into the business returns and partnership and trusts and states, and it's not a logical system at all, the tax code. So moving into auditing, I think the audit standards are a little more logical, easier to follow on why we do things the way we do. And, um, and then I found I love going out to clients. I love being out on site. And people think accounting is all about numbers. And public accounting really isn't. Numbers are a very small part of it. And the math we have to do is really easy math. It's add, subtract, multiply, divide. And every once in a while, you have to solve for x or something. But it's, it's really basic math. So when people hear I'm in accounting, it's like, oh, you must love math. No, not really. <laughs> math was never one of my favorite subjects. But accounting is really about the people. And going out to clients' offices and getting to talk to the business owner, getting to talk to the board of directors, and you're really in that inside track. And you hear the story of how somebody's built their business. And reading their financial statements, it kind of tells the story of what they've been doing. And, and then getting to see you know, one kind of business one week, and two weeks later, I'm going to be out at a completely different kind of business, and you know, switching the industries. And, and it gets kind of addicting, having that kind of variety and keeps it fun and interesting and certainly challenging along the way. Um, so the fun parts of public accounting. I made a list of some of my, my more memorable events. So just some of the things you get to do. I got a trip to Australia being in public accounting. So we have a large public company client in one of their regional offices. So they have subsidiaries all around the world. And one of their regional offices is just out. Um, it's in Canberra in Australia. So I got a week trip to Australia for that. Done a lot of fishing up in Alaska. We have a lot of clients up in Alaska. So that's been fun. And um, I've been moose counting in Alaska. So one of our clients that's based in Anchorage, they have an inventory warehouse out about 50 miles outside of Anchorage. And so I went with the warehouse supervisor. I had to go out there and count the inventory. And so we were counting moose along the way. And we saw 52. That's my record. <laughs> and this guy was a freelance photographer. So we were pulling over all the time and taking pictures. And it was a really amazing trip. And we didn't spend a lot of time counting the inventory. Um, shortcutted that part. Spent a lot of time watching the moose. It was amazing. And I've had a, a near-death experience flying in Alaska. N surprisingly, not on a propeller plane. I've been on a lot of those. And those actually don't scare me that much. But this was on an Alaska Airlines jet very near-death experience, so that's a longer story. Uh, I've been invited to drink fuel additive, which um, we have a client, they're not in business anymore, which, <laughs> <laughs> but um, they have this fuel additive. It was clean energy kind of a thing, and it was supposed to make their gas mileage better and have it burn cleaner. And, and this guy who created it, he's the CEO, the founder of the company, he kept saying, you can drink it, you can drink this stuff. And it looked like water. And so from the audit perspective, you know, how do you know it's not water, right? <laughs> and, but it kind of had this oily, it almost looked like baby oil or something. And he's like, no, really, you can drink it, come on. And he did. So we're sitting there <laughs> and we're watching him and he drank half a bottle of it. And so then, you know, and he thought he was proving to us that it was this great product, right? And I'm looking at it going, so again, how do we know that's not just water? <laughs> and um, I didn't drink it, and they're not in business anymore. But anyway, and last, let's see, last year I got a trip to New York City for a proposal meeting. It's, we like to do our proposal meetings for new clients in person. And so I flew to New York City, spent the night, and met with our prospective client for an hour and a half in the morning, went for a walk in Central Park, hopped on a plane, and came back. But those are fun trips. Um, and then just what I, I talked about before, being on the inside track of, of board meetings and hearing the big news, good and bad, first is always kind of fun. And being in the inside of those conversations. So as far as public accounting, um, it, there's certainly a level of sacrifice that comes with the industry anytime you have regulatory deadlines combined with being client service focused, there's always going to be that crunch time. And, and so there is a certain level of sacrifice that comes along with that sometimes. 
And, but there's also a lot of flexibility in being a professional. People are coming and going all the time. And you know, later in life, when you have to sneak out and go to your kids' you know, kindergarten play, or what I do now, I leave at 3.30 to make it to my daughter's four o'clock soccer game. And you know, nobody notices when you come and go. And as long as your work gets done, your work gets done. And technology certainly um, has helped that. So I'll talk more about that in a minute. So as far as my career, um, starting in public accounting, staying, starting in tax, moving into audit. I ended up at Peterson Sullivan. I started there in 95, so I spent a few years with a couple of smaller firms. And like Ross said, it's, um, it was a firm of about 40 people when I started. And so my learning curve really took off the nature of clients. And, and I went there for the diversity of clients and the variety. And, um, and I was always trying to position myself well for when I got out because I got in it just to get my license and to get some experience. So again, it was my brother coaching me, well, you know, if you do three years, then you're qualified for assistant controller type position. If you stay for five or six years, then maybe you can be a controller. And, and then if you stay seven or eight years, you could be controller of a bigger company and always trying to position myself for getting out. And, um, and certainly being a generalist was what you wanted to be then. And it's not that way now. Uh, everybody's looking for industry specialization now. But then knowing just a little bit about a lot of things was what you wanted to do. And then I figured I would be able to work in any industry when I got out, right? And I was always striving for the next promotion. And, but again, not thinking about how that positioned me in public accounting. It was all about, well, if I have the manager title, then I have the supervisory experience and I can get a better position when I get out. So uh, I ended up... Um, doing a lot to qualify myself for a job outside of public accounting, not so great inside. And, and I ended up doing a lot of interviewing outside of public accounting, trying to figure out what I wanted to do, if I was going to stay in it or if I was going to get out. Because you get to a certain point, and once you start hitting nine years of experience, 10 years of experience, then you find yourself overqualified for anything outside of public accounting. You can't, you can't, you're overqualified for most controller positions. But you can't really be a CFO until you've been a controller. And so there's this weird dichotomy. And, and after doing a lot of soul searching, a lot of interviewing, um, I found that I liked public accounting. And I really didn't want to leave. And in all my interviewing, the, the most appealing job ended up being at another CPA firm. <laughs> so it's like, well, OK, I, I think I like public accounting. So then I had a decision to make. And, and I was reflecting back on what I had done wrong at that point, I don't really believe in mistakes. I think all mistakes are just learning opportunities. But if I was to look back and think about any mistake that I made, it was really about thinking, I'd always thought in small chunks. And you know, as far as what I'm gonna do for the next year, the next two years would be about as far out as I would go. And I hated it when people asked me the question, where do you see yourself in five years and 10 years? Like, Who knows, who knows? You don't know what the world's going to be like. I don't know what my role's going to be in it or what I'm going to feel like doing. You know, it's, I didn't want to think about that. And, and I always wanted to be spontaneous. I wanted to be flexible, take any opportunity that came along, and be uncommitted. And when I think about that now, I've really lived a very unspontaneous life. So I was born and raised in Okanagan, a little small town in eastern Washington. And I've relocated one time, and that was to come to SPU. And, and then, you know, I've stayed here, obviously. And from SPU to where, uh, you know, my various apartments and houses, it's all been within an eight-mile radius. <laughs> so, so in Seattle, I really haven't ventured very far. I married my high school sweetheart. We're still married. And, um, and then now I've worked with, for Peterson Sullivan for over 20 years, so it really hasn't been very spontaneous. You know, so much for keeping my options open. And so in thinking about the small chunk thinking, my advice to you would be um, don't do that. <laughs> it's okay to think in long term. And I, I really hope that you live with intention. And um, Sheryl Sandberg has, uh, she's the chief operating officer of Facebook, and she has a saying that when you're in something, be all in. And, and I think that's one of my, I don't know, missteps in the early stages of my career, 
is that I was always looking for what else I wanted and what else was out there and I wasn't really focused on what I was doing and being committed and being all in. So it's really good advice. So I hope you guys can take that. It's whatever you're doing, just be in it all the way and live with intention. So the turning point for me was um, when my husband and I decided it was time to start a family. And up until then, uh, so my husband also went to SPU. He got his bachelor's here. He got his master's at Seattle University, and then he went to the University of Washington. He kind of hit them all to get his doctorate degree. So he's in graduate school, you know, the first 10 years of our marriage. And so I just worked. And, and public accounting kind of feeds the workaholic in people, and I got sucked into that. And so, I mean, it was normal. My normal hour schedule would be 50, 60 hours a week, pretty much year round. During the crunch time, it would be 70, 80, and I usually had a couple of months where I was doing 90 hour weeks. So I don't want that to scare you because you don't have to do it that way. It's just what I got sucked into, and I was putting my hand up for all of the travel jobs, and I was out of town a week, two weeks, pretty much out of every month. And, and that's what worked for us. It's, I was loving what I was doing and, and you know, always trying to get the next promotion and working really hard and my husband was in graduate school, so it worked. Um, but not everybody has to do it that way, so don't worry about that. And, um, but so now when I'm thinking about what it would be like to have a baby, it's, that's not a sustainable life if I'm gonna have a child at home, and, but I didn't really know how to do my job any other way. And in looking at the firm at that point, there had been women who had had babies and the majority of them left the firm. And the few that had come back, they came back full time, and which generally means more than full time. And I wasn't sure I wanted that either. And, and so I really had to think through what I wanted to do. And I pretty much concluded I was going to have to leave. And I figured I could find some contract work or some part-time work or do something for a year or two, and then maybe I'd be ready to get back into public accounting and do something different. So that's how I was going through it. And it was interesting, you know, our partner group was all men at, at that point, and we didn't have, the firm was small enough, we didn't have a human resources director or anything. The various partners would do those roles. And so we had one of these guys who was our all right, he's one of our tax partners, and he was our HR director. And then we had the partner who was in charge of the audit department. So these two were the ones who needed to talk to me about my plans, and they're really uncomfortable talking about pregnancy and babies and, and stuff. So they, they didn't you know, bring it up. So I'm literally two weeks before my due date. I'm waddling through the hallways, and still they hadn't asked me what I was going to do. And, and so they finally you know, call me in, and and sit me down and, and they asked, yeah, what are your plans? And so I went into that conversation thinking, all right, I'm giving my notice. And so I'm telling them why I wanted to leave. And I told them, you know, I'm not gonna be able to work the hours that I work. And, and they're agreeing, yeah, yeah, you know, so what are you thinking? And, and I told them, well, I'm, I think I want something, I'm gonna look for something, you know, 20 hours a week, 25 hours a week, something like that. I just need something more flexible. And so again, I think I'm giving notice and telling them why I'm leaving. And, and they smile and say, okay, we can do that. Uh, really, what? what? And, and so it's like, well, so, so I could do that? It's like, well, I'm not gonna be able to travel. And, and they're like, okay, we can reassign all of your travel engagements. It's like, well, that might not be enough to still get it down to your 20 hours a week-ish. And that, that's okay, we'll work with you on your schedule and, and skinny it down to what you can accommodate. And it's like, well, but what about my benefits? Because I'd read in the handbook, you had to work at least 30 hours a week to keep your benefits. That's okay, we'll freeze it. And so we go through this conversation and figure out how much time I'm gonna take away and how I would be compensated. And I was like, oh, well, I, I guess I'll come back. And so through that conversation, I became the first professional to return on a part-time flexible schedule and which was a milestone for me and certainly a milestone for the firm and and I still don't know if even today those two partners realized that I went into that conversation planning to leave and and so they get a lot of credit for being open-minded and being willing to do something and and they retained a high performer person in doing that so that was a big step for the firm and now certainly coming back you know on a flexible schedule, that's the normal thing. 
and most of our new moms come back on a flexible schedule and some of them it's a permanent thing some of them just do it for a short time and we have three dads who are also doing limited and part-time schedules too and and it's not just parents who can do it it's open to anybody and for any reason so um, that's been really amazing and really uh, so I had mentioned technology has changed our profession and really that's where technology has come in the biggest play and certainly when I was part-time everything was in paper and and doing audits different people are working on different sections somebody's working on cash somebody's working on accounts payable somebody else is working on revenue and I was a manager at the time and so you had to have those paper files and so there were so many times it'd be 10 30 11 o'clock at night i'm driving down to the office to pick up certain sections to review returning other sections so other people can keep reviewing and now everything is paperless so it's all in the system and i can literally be sitting in my pajama pants at my kitchen table and have access to everything that i would have you know had access it's all the client files and I can make phone calls and it looks like I'm calling from the firm. I can accept phone calls through the computer and, and, and it's been amazing. And actually this year the firm adopted what we call a work anywhere, anytime strategy. And that's not just for people who need flexible schedules. It's, it's really been in response to some absurd commute times that some of our people have. And certainly with the housing prices in Seattle, people are buying houses in Burien and Maple Valley and up in Linwood and Eastside. And it, it takes people an hour or two hours to get into work. And, and so we've gone to the work anywhere, anytime. And, and so if you want to avoid the main commute time, I mean, sometimes it's easier to just go straight to a client's or just work from home, find a coffee shop. Um, I love the Bellevue Library. There's free parking, free Wi-Fi, comfy chairs. It's quiet. And um, you know, wherever you can get your work done the best and make your life as easy as possible is what we've moved to now, which technology has really allowed. Um, so in working a flexible schedule, there were some things that I wanted to touch on, things that I learned that I still work on that pretty much every day. And when I was working the flexible schedule, uh, it, it was the perfect balance for me. I got to be the primary caregiver for my daughter, and I was there for all the first, the first step, the first laugh, and you know all those fun things. But it also taught me being a stay-home mom full-time wasn't the best thing for me. And I really looked forward to my days at work. And, and that was a, a, a surprise to me. I had never really considered myself as a career person for how much time and energy I spent working. It, it just hadn't really struck me as that I, I wanted the career. And, but I, I get a lot of value, a lot of self-satisfaction out of working with my clients and helping them and working with staff and the training and the recruiting and just being technically challenged on a regular basis. It's, that's kind of fun too. And, and so that was a big eye-opening moment for me. So um, some of the things that I learned in working part-time is time management. And I've learned that your task at hand, and maybe some of you have experienced this, it, it kind of expands with the time that you have to do it. So when you're coming up to a deadline, and you know, certainly being part-time when I was only there from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. and I had to go pick up my daughter after that, it's, it's amazing how much you can get done when you're focused and on it. And, and part of that is prioritizing. So learning what's urgent and what's not. And there's a lot of things that seem like they're really urgent, there really aren't when you dig down to it. And certainly before I went on maternity leave, it was, I used to make all these copious notes of everything, you know, because I didn't know if I was, you know, going to be back the next day or not. And I had this whole list that um, once I was out of the office for a while, I was emailing all these people, this needs to be done, this needs to be done, don't forget, don't forget. And, you know, when I came back a couple of months later, all of those things were still there. Nobody had done them. And they were all still waiting for me. And all these things that I th thought were so urgent and so important, it's like everybody was fine waiting. And, and I've learned there's a lot of things about that that happen in life that, you know, come through your day that seem really urgent that maybe aren't. And, and knowing how to figure that out. And then the art of delegating is, is huge. And, and delegating is hard because when you have something to do, it's usually always easier to just do it yourself. And it takes a lot of time to explain it to somebody else and check in with them and answer their questions and make sure they did it right. And, but the advantage is the next time 
that task comes up. That if you're always just doing it yourself, well then you have to do it again next time too. And if you invest some time up front, show somebody else how to do it, then the next time they can just run with it and it's off your plate. And so learning how to prioritize delegation is huge. And the importance of communicating, being really direct, being really clear, stop apologizing, and, and how to talk about just what's relevant. And because I, again, I tend to be a tangent person. <laughs> and, and so really streamlining communications is really important. And then the most important thing I learned uh, is the importance of internal networking. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And, and so by going through my career up until that point, always looking for what else I was going to do, I didn't spend a lot of time focusing on the career I already had in public accounting. And internal networking is so important. And it's not just in public accounting, it's in any business setting. And, and everybody talks about your external network and you know, building those contacts and having lots of LinkedIn connections. And all of that is great too. But the only way to a senior leadership position is through internal networking. And it's something that I don't think people talk about enough. And so when I returned to full-time, so I worked part-time for two and a half years, then returned to full-time, I was promoted to senior manager. And, and at that point, the next step was going to be partner. And, and so looking at what I needed to do to get from senior manager to partner, it seemed like a really big step. And you know, I hadn't done a good job at my internal marketing and the internal networking side. And, and I had two, two male partners who played really big roles for me. And one of them, he was a retired partner at the time I came back full time. And, and he was a partner when I first joined Peterson Sullivan, I worked almost exclusively with him and he was actually a really, really difficult person to work for. And, and so it's odd that once he was retired and he left the firm, <laughs> that he really, he's the one who reached out to maintain communications with me. And he really ended up being a strong mentor for me. And, and he helped me define what it was that I wanted and why I wanted it and then how to articulate that and, and what I needed to go through. And then the other, and so he was kind of the mentor. And, and then I had a, another partner who I started working with more. And, and he was really my internal champion. And so he spent a lot of time grooming me and talking to me about what I needed to do as far as my leadership qualities and the internal network that I needed to start building. And he, prom he did a lot of promotional work for me to our existing partner group too. And taking every opportunity he had to talk to the rest of the partners about how great I was and how they needed to get to know me. And, and you know, of our partner group, there's only a couple of them that I work with on a regular basis. And so there's all the tax partners, there's the industry specialty partners, our business valuation partner, and all these other partners who I didn't work with and didn't know. But so you have to be intentional about creating the opportunities to get to know them and really build those relationships. And then, so that's looking up. And then in looking down, you've got to have a lot of visibility too to all of the staff and other people I work with. They needed to, to see me as a future leader. And so I needed to find ways and opportunities in the firm to have that visibility and have those, you know, just the small, small step leadership roles that then others would be able to see me that way. And, and then the biggest thing is I needed to start thinking like a partner myself and seeing myself in that role. And, and so like, have you ever heard the saying um, that about that you need to dress and act like the job you want. And, and that's kind of what, what that's about. That, and it's weird because inside, you don't really feel any different. And what I'm talking about, it's like, it's just me. I, I haven't changed. But as you start moving up into those leadership roles, and as you want even more senior leadership roles, you have to realize that other people see you differently, and you need them to see you differently. And, and you have to start dressing and acting like that role that you want. Um, and, and for me, on, on my path, it, it was a little bit different because there weren't any women partners. And so the whole partnership group was all men, and they're all nice men and very smart men, and men who like working with women, but, but they're all men. 
And, and some of them had small children at home, but the ones who had small children, they also had a full-time stay-home wife. And, and then the other ones, you know, there were a couple of them who had wives working, but their kids were either out of the house or they didn't have kids. And, and so the way I was doing it and my path was going to be different. And, um, and so, uh, and we still, so out of our partner group now, there's 20 partners and there's two of us who are women. Although I'll tell you, um, I told Ross earlier, we have uh, one woman uh, principal right now and she's up for vote this year for her partner. So hopefully January 1, we're gonna have another one. So we're getting there. But, um, and really having a male dominated partner group is not just a Peterson Sullivan thing. And it's not just a public accounting thing. It's, I mean, when you look at all of business and you look at the C-suite categories, all the CEOs and the CFOs, the chief operating officers, the chief technology officers, and, and even on boards of directors, it's, it's pretty heavy male dominated. And there's been a lot of publicity about how to change that. And, and so public accounting is still definitely working with that. But since I think numbers tell a story, I had some statistics pulled. And in the last 10 years for college grads in, with accounting majors, it's been about 55% women and 45% men, pretty consistently for the last 10 years. And per the American Institute of CPAs in 2015, women comprised 44% of all employees at CPA firms and 19% of the partner group. And then if you break down the women partners between women, the equity partners, so women who actually have ownership in the firm, and then there's also what's called income partners, and so they're more partner in name only, they don't actually have ownership, that it's believed that equity owners are really only about 10%. But not all firms uh, give that breakdown of their partner groups, so that's a little bit harder to tell. So it's a common, common thing. So when I made partner in 2006, I became the first woman partner that Peterson Sullivan had promoted to partner, and which was another milestone for me, of course, and, and for the firm. And then my other woman partner, Rachel Lemieux, she's our state and local tax partner. She's amazing. She joined the firm about three years ago. So I had lots of time being the only woman partner and it seems like in recruiting conversations and even just when I'm out networking, people ask me about that a lot. Yeah, what's that like, <laughs> being the only girl in the room? And, and it's, it really wasn't that much of a change because when I'm out there meeting with my clients, most of my clients are men, the CEOs, the CFOs, and their boards, and it's really a common thing for me to be sitting in a meeting around the table and I'm the only woman. And I've figured out guys don't notice that I don't think anybody really notices that. And, and then certainly in our, in our partner group, I think that's true too. And all the things that I worried about, like if I was going to have a voice and if they would value my opinion, and I don't know, I thought maybe any ideas might seem way out there and not be a good fit. And none of that has been an issue. And um, one of the conversations that I always remember, so the partner who was really my champion, and before our very first, it was my first partner meeting, he was kind of going through the agenda and what was planned and he was talking about all the different personalities and the dynamics in the room and how he thought the conversation would go and he just wanted to make sure I felt really ready. And, you know, again, his first partner meeting and, you know, he's asking, okay, so how are you feeling? Are you ready? You feel good? And it's going to be fine. And, and I was sitting there listening to him talk and I, and I was telling him, I said, you know, as I sit there and think about it, he said, you know, all you guys are going to be sitting around the table. I'm gonna come in the room and I don't even have to say anything. And all I have to do is just sit there in the room and I don't even have to say anything. And the whole dynamics of the room will be different than it was before. It's like, do you guys realize that? Uh, and he looked at me, he's like, yeah, yeah, we do. He said, and we can't wait. So it's been a really good experience. And um, so, so for me, that's how my career has progressed. And, and it, it's all worked out, despite the trips that I made along the way. And certainly now when I see my brother, so my brother is also in public accounting. He's the managing partner of a firm over in Yakima. And I think that we're really different people. And I think he'd be a really difficult person to work with. And so it always strikes me as really <laughs> odd that now we do the same thing. 
And, and so when we talk shop, when we get together, I have to admit to him that he was right and accounting was a good major for me. And, and certainly getting my start here at SPU and with all of you doing that, it's you're in good hands and it'll be great for you. So that's all I had to talk about. <laughs> We are open for questions. Yes, open for questions. <laughs> yes? I'm just curious, what has been your favorite part about public accounting in your all of your experience, like whether it's a certain industry or I would say my favorite part, what has kept me in it is the variety. And and being able to be on that inside track with so many different kinds of companies. And it's when I was interviewing and trying to decide if I was gonna stay in or get out, that's what really kept me in. Because every time I would talk to a company, it's like the thought of just working for one company in just one industry and doing one thing, it's like, oh, that sounds so boring. Even if it's a big company doing different stuff, it's, it's the same industry and the variety gets addicting. And, and you have to be okay with an unpredictable schedule. And you, know, you might come into work and you think you know what you're doing, but one phone call from a client or you know, something, it changes everything. And oh, that's what I'm doing today is gonna be different and next week and now I gotta get on a plane and go do something. And, and, but I like that part of it. So for people who like real predictable stuff, um, probably not the best, but I like the variety and all that. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. So we're hearing more and more that our students should start networking now. And you mentioned internal, building internal networks. So how do you start the process of networking when it seems kind of big and ominous? Well, so there's, there's two kinds, the external and the internal. And I would say as a student, you're focused more on the external networking as far as finding employment after graduation. But that said, you still have internal networking to do and, you know, within the business school. Make sure you know your professors really well and, and take the opportunity to make those relationships. Know people in the career department and you know, anyone that could help you get a job and, and keep in touch with people in your classes and graduating and, and certainly in your major. And after graduation, keep in touch with people. And because when you're looking for either making a change or it's a small world, if you stay in, even if you don't stay in Seattle, but certainly the Seattle business community is a small world. And, and chances are you're gonna run across one of your college friends. They might be able to help you you know, with a future job or you might be able to help them or, you know, some way. It's, it's always good to start building that as early as possible. And then once you get in to, you know, whatever, whatever your job ends up being, take the time to build relationships with people. And, and when people are doing things in the evening after work or getting together on weekends, I used to think it was weird. I had my personal friends and then I had my work friends and there wasn't any crossover. And at Peterson, and then when I joined Peterson Sullivan, people were having dinner parties, and they would, you know, go on weekend trips together, and, and all the stuff. And at first, that seemed really strange to me, and but now I can't imagine it any other way. But make the time to participate in some of that and start building those relationships. Did that answer your question? Yeah. So when I interviewed with Matt Smith last week, he told me that uh, you know. He had a hard time telling his wife how much fun work was. And he <laughs> yeah, um, now I totally get so that. What, what do you think then is the most difficult part of uh, mm. working with Peterson Sullivan? Because it sounds great, you know, from a bunch of different people now. Right. Is it all great? Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's always there's good days and bad days with any job, and and in public accounting. I mean, there, there is a level of sacrifice because there are going to be times when you miss an event and you end up, sorry, I'm going to be late today. And um, so those aren't always as fun. But yeah, it's, I've had a hard time explaining to my husband too because, and it's a little bit, 
you know, like when you're working up to a deadline and, and especially when you've been out of town, you know way too much about your coworkers after spending a week out of town with them. And, and you know, you'll be spending all this time with people and you're working so hard and you got to meet this deadline and you've been working all these overtime. And then when we get the job done and the client gets their stuff on time and, and then we all want to go out together afterwards and, and celebrate. And then my husband's on the phone going, really? You spent you know, 70 hours with these people this week and you want to go spend a few more hours with them. It's like, what about me? And, and so it, that's hard to explain, and, but that's what Matt's talking about. And it's kind of, I, I equate it for my husband to like being on a sports team, that you guys are in the playoffs and you, know, you win a game and then you advance to the next one and it's so exciting and you're so into it. And then you win the championship game and you just want to go celebrate and have fun. And, and yeah, you missed seeing a lot of other people and spending time with friends and family along the way because you're so concentrated on that. But it's, yeah, you need to have those celebration times too. So, so there is a lot of great stuff, but to get to the great part, there are some sacrifices along the way too. That's, that's kind of an adrenaline rush though. <laughs> <laughs> Charlotte, you just, uh, yeah. your, your firm is just being on campus. Uh, yeah. Right? Our students, I, you, did I hear you went to, was there about nine or ten, something like that? What, what are the two or three, four things mm -hmm. that you're really looking for in a, in a graduate that will be a good fit in, in public accounting in particular in your firm? Yeah, so when we're interviewing, you know, we don't expect you to know everything. We can train you on the technical knowledge. And as long as you have the basis, intermediate's huge for that. And um, so we're looking for fit to our firm and we're looking for people, you know, certainly on the audit side and even on the tax side to some extent, you're from day one, you're put in front of clients. And so you need to be able to look and talk and act like you're worth $125 an hour. And, and so we're looking for people who have that confidence, who have that professional presence, who can speak well and communicate well. And, and we look for people who understand the industry, who understand what they're getting into and know a little bit about how public accounting works, that you're gonna, you don't have just one boss. And you, know, you might be working on a nonprofit one week and you might be working on a manufacturing company another week and mm -hmm. it's all gonna be different and you're gonna be reporting to different people. And, and in doing that, you know, not one person knows what your workload is. And, and so you have to take the initiative and be really self-driven about managing your own workload. And that happens from day one. So we're looking for people who have demonstrated their ability to handle a lot of different things all at one time. And sometimes college is just inherently that way. And, but we're looking for people who have gone a little bit above that and taken some leadership roles or you have some kind of a story in some way that you've, you've demonstrated the ability to have that initiative and have that self-motivation. So, yeah, and just people who are ambitious and want to have some fun. But, yeah? You interact with CFOs in your role, but you yourself have a leadership role in an accounting firm. How would you describe the difference between leadership in finance and leadership in accounting? That was kind of a hard transition when I became a partner because up until becoming a partner, it's all about my clients. And, and I was involved in firm initiatives as far as the recruiting and training and things like that, but not really about running the firm as a business. And then as a partner, it's all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting the firm's financial statements now and, you know, we have revenue targets and, and everything. And I hadn't really thought about running a business. And, and that's, that's been, a, that was a transition to realize that, oh, the firm is a business too. And, but it's been a fun part too, because that was always, since my whole career has been in public accounting, when I'm talking to my clients, I always felt like there was a little bit of a gap there because I, didn't know what running a business is like. And I've never been on the industry side. So when they were talking about, you know, what keeps them up at night, that I didn't always have the context to know what they were talking about. And now I feel like I do have some of that. And even though we're a professional services firm and it doesn't always, you know, tie into a manufacturing firm. I mean, when they're talking about the payroll laws changing and, you know, things like that, it's, oh, I know, I get that. And, you know, finding people to hire and, and 
different ways of training and, and yeah, so as far as running the business as a partner, because pretty much all of the partners have some administrative roles. And then I was on our firm's executive committee for a term as well. And, and the way we're managed, we have a managing partner and we also have an executive committee that's made up of four partners and the managing partner is one of those. And, and so the executive committee and managing partner are really the ones charged with the strategic plan of the firm and figuring out how to make it happen. And then those people report to the full, you know, you're accountable to the full partner group. And, and so that, that really was an eye-opening experience too, as far as managing the firm. Because there's all the kinds of things that before you're a partner, you know, it's like, well, why don't we do this? And why can't we do this? And I just wish we would, you know, do it this way. And, and then once I'm a partner, it's like, oh, now I get it. <laughs> you, you can't just, you know, there's always, for everything that you do, there's gonna be something that you're not doing. And, and yeah, just the dynamics of running a business has been interesting. Anything else? Not going to thank Charlene on behalf of the school. I think some of you have to get back to class, but I believe Charlene does have a few minutes to stick around afterwards if you want to yeah. greet her. I also will mention that our next Dean Speaker series is in January, and I believe the speaker is King County Council member Larry Gossett, is who we've got booked. So that would be the next one. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening.